So good evening and welcome everyone. And first of all, let's uh, begin by saying that we are all very fortunate, both the teacher and the students, that we have the opportunity to come here tonight or you know twice a week and have these lumbering classes. If we look in this world, if we look at the percentage, if we look uh, at things in terms of percentages, right? You will, we will see that the, in terms of uh, those beings who are born as humans, humans are very few. Then from amongst those who are few humans, we, who are a small group, those uh, who do not have any religious interest, as opposed to those who do have religious interest, are the majority. So those who are interested in practicing dharma or religious practices are very few. Then again, from among those, uh, many um, follow, you know, wrong type of systems, wrong religions, or they follow in a wrong way. So those who follow a correct system are very few. And then, um, if you consider all of this, you will see that here we are, and we have this excellent opportunity to study the Lamrim. And you have to understand that this is something which is very rare. Once you understand how rare it is, it will generate a sense of joy within your mind. And it is worthwhile to rejoice that, look, I have something which is very rare. Not many people, not many beings are able to do that. So this is by looking at the world in general. Now, if we were to look at those at this situation within Singapore, right? We have to understand that the majority of the people every day, they have to work very hard in order to um, just, you know, keep up, you know, with the necessities of life. So the people who have the leisure to put aside a couple of hours twice a week to come to a class like this, again, uh, are very special people because it is something which is very rare. So. For you to, that you're coming here to attend these classes, again, you have to think of yourself as being someone who is very special for making this particular effort. And then Geshe says, on the other hand, you come here and you have to receive teachings from myself. And I am not a great scholar, I'm not a great practitioner. However, I have spent many times, many years in the monastery and through the training and the classes we have in the monastery, and of course through having the opportunity to receive teachings from my own teachers, the spiritual friends that I have, somehow was fortunate enough to receive all this information. So I have heard quite a few teachings. But I have to say that, you know, I recognize, and you should recognize yourself, that the fact that you are coming under these conditions in this society, that you make the time and you come here because, uh, to receive these teachings and you show this interest in Buddhism, it's a special sign that you are really interested in practicing. So, you know, take that to mind, keep this to mind, rejoice for the unique opportunities um, that we have here. And with this frame of mind, without elaborating even more, I mean, there's quite much more one could say, but without going any further, let's all recite together Gantling like Emma, set the motivation and accumulate the merit. Okay, so up to now, we have been looking at the benefits of relying on a spiritual teacher, and also we're looking at the faults and the shortcomings that come if we do not rely on the spiritual teacher. Now, last week, uh, we entered this section that um, explains that if you criticize or if you disobey your teacher, then uh, you will not develop the realizations that you're looking for. And even if you have the capacity to achieve great results, actually the, what you will achieve will be minimized, it will be delayed and so forth. And we looked at various stories that illustrate exactly this point. Actually, we elaborated quite a lot with the story, so we didn't progress much last week. 
So we continue from where we left off. We are at the top of page 232. So it's talking now about bad company. It says, if you mix with bad company, your insights and realizations will be dimmed. You must avoid such things. Most people these days only cling to this life. Everybody overvalues this life. So most people are preoccupied about, about this life. They have great attachment for the experiences of this life. And where it says here they overvalue this life, it means they take this life to be the most important. And because this is the case, then they spend all the time and energy pursuing those material wealth and comfort and, you know, everything about this life. Even those who care about us and those we look upon as helping us are actually bad company. So there are some people who appear, you know, externally. They appear to be very, very caring. They appear to be very supportive. They appear to be very friendly. However, we're not to, um, just because they appear in this way, it doesn't mean they are real friends. In reality, as it says here, they are bad company. Bad company don't wear coarse sackings and they don't have horns on their heads. Bad company means people who make you do something non-virtuous out of faint concern for your welfare or who prevent you from doing something virtuous. So you have the aspiration to practice virtue, you want to follow, follow a virtuous path. And then these people come along, they, they show the aspect of having great care for you, great affection for you, so they say, out of concern for you, uh, I would advise you this and that. And basically what they do is they make you uh, step away from the virtuous path, and they even make you engage in negativity. So the person who does this to you is classified as um, a bad company. So it says here, ignore, how are we to, you know, how are we to relate to these people? It says, ignore such people, no matter who they may be. Regard them as terrifying, as if they were mad elephants, tigers, or leopards, and avoid them. So if you were to meet a leopard or a lion or a tiger and so forth, you would be scared and you would just keep your distance, isn't it? So it says, keep your distance from these people. Then it says, there are still some who have few wants and are content. So it's talking about real practitioners. It's actually quite difficult to come to the point to have a few wants and to have contentment. Few wants means you don't keep wanting more and better and, uh, you know, something more, something better and so forth. You know, it's it's all right. You you sort of like uh, um, your expectations, uh, you keep your expectations low. The next one to have contentment. Have contentment means whatever is available for me right now, whatever I have right now, that is enough, that is sufficient. When you're lacking contentment, you might have something. So let's say you have a car, but somehow you need a bigger car. You have a TV in the house, but that's not enough. You need a second TV or you need, you know, a bigger TV. You have clothes, your clothes are fine, but you're not contented with what you have. You need to have a new set of clothes and so on and so forth. So if you have great desire and if you don't have contentment, what happens is that constantly you think that you need to have more, bigger, uh, better and so forth. And then that means that you will follow um, a path uh, that will help you acquire all these extra material things. So that means you're going to deviate from your practice. Okay, so it's actually a rare thing. You're a real practitioner if you have few desires and you have contentment. And then there's a slight mistake in the translation. Then it says, such people say soothing things like, it's not such people, it's not the people who have few desires and contentment. There are other people who now come and interfere with those people who have few desires. And they say soothing things such as, don't give up so much. Nothing comes from giving up so much. 
people who, who say such things are in fact bad company, but don't contradict them directly and don't insult them. You don't need to have an argument with those people, you know, you don't need to speak in a rude manner. But what you do is you just continue doing your practice. Okay. And then again, a little mistake in the translation. It says that is not the right way for us to practice. Actually, in the Tibetan says you just continue with your practice. So it doesn't matter what they say, they're trying to interfere, but you just continue with your practice. So there's a very important point that is made here. The whole thing about Dharma and about practice. So if you're talking about Dharma and if you're talking about practice, it is not something that is about this life. It is something that it can have benefit for your future life. If it is all about this life, it is not Dharma, it is not practice. If it is all about this life, then it becomes a cause for you to remain within samsara. If you are preoccupied with this life, that's it, you're going to be stuck in samsara. But if you have something, if you have some concern, if, it, if you're doing something that will be of benefit for your future lives, then that is classified as dharma. So it's very important for us to understand this. So we're saying that um, it is dharma if it is something which is of benefit for your next life. But we have to understand that actually once we state it in this way, we're not necessarily referring to the dharma of the great scope, but definitely we are talking about the dharma of the small scope or the practices of the individual of the small scope. And the reason for that is because if we are serious about reaching the state of enlightenment, the state of Buddhahood, the state of enlightenment is obtained on the basis of a physical body. You need to guarantee, you need to make sure that you have a very good physical support and the human body is the best support for doing these practices that lead to Buddhahood. So your first concern is to make sure that you will avoid falling into the lower migrations. So then, you know, as a human or perhaps as a god, preferably as a human from that point onward, you can continue with your practice. So this is why we state it in this way. So we continue now with the next outline. It says, in this life you will suffer undesirable illnesses and so on. So if you disparage, if you criticize, if you disobey the guru, the spiritual friend, then in this life you will have the unfortunate experience of um, experiencing many types of illnesses, not just one, one type of illness, but many, they are obviously they are undesirable, um, and there are many different types of harm that will come to you. So it begins by quoting from the 50 verses of Guru devotion that says, disparage your master. So disparage here means criticize your master from the bottom of your heart, like sincerely, like you really mean it. So disparage your master and great fool, you will die. So the great fool is the person who is criticizing and disparaging the master. So he says, if you're doing this, you're a fool. And if you do this, the result is you will die. You will die how? You will die from plagues. So plagues are diseases that spread um, very much in the, you know, in the population and they are very difficult to avoid. Second, painful illnesses, so not, not a small illness, not a light illness, but something that will make you physically suffer. And then we have spirits. Spirits, there are different classes of spirits. So here we're talking about harm that can be caused to you by Nagas and by different kinds of spirits. There is one type of spirit that is called the ever-present spirit, ever-present because it can go everywhere. It can go everywhere, it means it can follow you everywhere. So wherever you are, it will follow you and will cause you harm. There are other types of spirits, such as a spirit that causes you um, to become incoherent with your speech. So instead of being able to talk properly, 
what you do is you lose control and you are laughing all the time. So this is a type of harm that can happen to you from a spirit. Spirits and nagas and so forth can cause different types of harm to us. And then we have the epidemics and the poison. So if you are a fool who disparages the guru, you will die out of those causes. Then it continues, uh, mentioning other types of harm. Uh, kings, fire, and poisonous snakes, floods, witches, thieves, demons, and vile spirits will kill you. Then, sentient being, you go to hell. So here we have the harm that can come from kings, harm that comes from fire, from snakes, from floods. The word for witches here is dakinis, who fly up in the sky, thieves, demons and again uh, spirits that are very negative all of those types of beings they will kill you and once they kill you they will go to hell so it says never upset the mind of your master if you blindly do so you will surely roast in hell so where it says if you blindly do so blindly here means out of ignorance out of confusion so if you are so ignorant, if you are so confused that you upset the mind of the guru by criticizing, uh, disobeying him and so forth, then definitely you will fall in the hells and there you will boil, you will roast, you will have to experience all this intense suffering in the hells. He continues by saying, those who disparage their masters were rightly told they, that they stay in any of the terrifying hells, such as the hell without respite. So very clearly, the result is to take rebirth in one of the worst hells, the hell without respite. That is, if you disparage your master, you will suffer many kinds of illness in this life. So if you behave in this way, once you, once you establish a relationship and then you start disobeying and disrespecting the teacher, then in this very life, you will have to experience not one, but many types of illness, all of them serious, all of them unwanted. At one time in ancient India, Acharya Buddhajnana was giving a Dharma teaching. His guru, a Mahasiddha, was a swineherd. The guru arrived during the teachings and Buddhajnana pretended not to see him. So the first mistake that he made was that although he saw his teacher arriving, he pretended he didn't see him. And then Buddhajnana later lied to his guru saying, I did not see you. So first he pretended he didn't see him and later on when they actually met face to face, he lied and he said, I didn't see you. So the result of that, whereupon his eyes actually fell out and dropped on the ground. So this is the result of pretending and lying to your guru as he did. Another, another example, Sultrim, the neighbor of Dako Jampil Lundrum Rinpoche, was disrespectful and had no faith towards Rinpoche. Later, a thief smashed, smashed Sultrim's head with a rock at Gokir Pass, and he died. Kapche Papom Karimboche told these stories, and also told the story of, of one of um, Nezurpa's disciples, who broke his tantric commitments, and how he had terrifying visions when he died. So as you can see, under this heading, we're looking at the, obviously, disadvantages of uh, not properly relying on the teacher. So it is, you can see from this, from what is described here, it is very important that we get this relationship right. Once you establish a relationship with a teacher, you must try to avoid all of these mistakes because the consequences are quite heavy. Okay, we continue now with the next outline. It's uh, the seventh of the eight disadvantages. It says you will wander endlessly, endlessly in the lower realms in your next lives. So this expression here, endlessly, you know that you can f see the limit or you can see the end of something. So for example, let's say you have a, a field or a piece of land and usually at the end of that uh, property, we have the border, 
Okay, so you can say this is the limit or this is the end. But when there is no limit, there is no end, then you're talking about something which is endless, something which is limitless. So it's a very emphatic um, word here because it says you will wander endlessly in the lower realms in your next lives. So if you uh, disobey, if you, dis if you disparage, if you criticize the guru, this will be the result. And then it says, this is the worst penalty for people who disparage their guru. So from all the other disadvantages that we have, this is the worst. So um, this is mentioned in the Vajrapani Initiation Tantra. The sutras tell many stories about rebirth in the hells, but this tantra does not teach that a person who disparages his guru will be born in these hells. Okay, it's a mistake where it says here, this tantra, it is this, this referring to the sutra. So the point that is made here is that the sutras uh, tell many stories about people who disparage the gurus and then they were born in the hells. However, in the sutras, we don't have specific quotations. We don't have specific references that say, because he did this, he was born in such and such a hell. So there are some general stories, but there are no specific indications in the sutra. We know that in the tantras, there are specific indications. Just before, in the previous outline, from the 50 verses of Guru Devotion, it says, if you do this, you will be reborn in the hell without respite. So this is a specific reference. In tantra, we have specific reference. But in sutra, we do not have specific reference of exactly which hell you will be reborn. Okay, so the tantra says, in the tantra, we have references. Okay, so the tantra says, Vajrapani asked, O Bhagavan, what are the ripening effects of disparaging one's master? So obviously we have a, a, a section from a tantra here. It's a dialogue between Vajrapani and the Buddha, and the Vajrapani is asking the questions and is giving the opportunity to the Buddha to give an answer. So the question that Vajrapani had was, if you disparage the guru, if you disobey the guru and so forth, what will be the ripening effect of such action? And the Bhagavan gave this reply to the request for an explanation of these ripening effects. O oh, Vajrapani, I will not tell you, for it would terrify the world, gods and all. But, O oh Lord of the Esoteric, I will say this much. So, the Buddha is going to give an answer, but he has already said that I will not tell you in detail. I cannot tell you in detail, because if I were to tell you exactly what are the ripening re results, the whole world will be terrified. The gods, the humans, everybody will be terrified. But since you are asking, um, and it is, uh, you know, it is suitable for me to give an answer, I should give you an answer. I would just give you, let's say, a general answer, not a specific. So I will only say this much without going into details. And then it says heroes. It's not heroes in plural. It's hero, just one hero, because he's referring to Vajrapani. Right, so it says hero, pay attention, listen. So I'm going to explain this, listen carefully. I say, those people will stay in any of the mighty hells I described while teaching on the heinous crimes and so forth. So previously the Buddha has taught about the heinous crimes, which are actions such as killing your own father, killing your own mother, um, you know, causing a schism in the Sangha, extracting blood from the Buddha with bad intention and so on and so forth, killing an Arhat and so forth. So the Buddha has previously given teachings on this subject and says if you do this, you will uh, um, end up in one of the hells. So without getting into great detail, he says it will be something similar. Just as you are born in the hells if you commit any of the five heinous crimes, if you disparage the guru, 
you will be reborn in the hells. And this for infinite eons. So the next question, obviously, that comes up is, if you're born there, how long will you have to remain there? So it says there it will be for infinite eons. Infinite, again, here indicates an extremely long um, period of time. So in the, in the heading, in the outline, we had endlessly. And you can see here is using the word infinite, meaning it's going to take a very, very long time. So, never, never despise your master. So, very emphatic words here with a repeat of the words never, meaning under any circumstances, in any occasion, you should never do it. In other words, Buddha did not dare go into detail because he knew that the world, gods and all, would be terrified. And even the bodhisattvas and mahasattvas would faint. So, if the Buddha were to give a detailed explanation, everyone would be terrified. Terrified to the point where the bodhisattvas would faint, would lose consciousness. So, he didn't dare go into detail knowing it would cause great fear to everybody. So, he taught only that such people must remain in the hell without respite for many years. So he just said, roughly, let me tell you, hell without respite and for a very long time, without going into details. So they say, it is never right to disparage your guru. So this is the conclusion, right? It is very negative, it is very bad to disparage a guru. Apart from not actually dis disparaging him yourself, it is not even right to look at someone else who has done so as this story shows. So, let alone doing that thing yourself, it is not good to even look at someone who has done this negative action. So, the story here, once wise uh, Lingrepa, a great adept, was teaching the Dharma, a disciple of Chak, the translator, turned up. This disciple had broken his tantric commitments so, had broken his commitment here means he has broken his commitments towards the teacher. He had criticized the teacher. So, suddenly, Lingrepa's mouth became paralyzed. He was unable to teach and departed. So, just by looking at him, at this other person who arrived, who had broken the commitment towards the teacher, uh, this uh, Lingrepa was not able to speak anymore. His mouth was paralyzed. It was as if he got a stroke. And as it says here, obviously he wasn't able to speak, he wasn't able to teach. He departed, departed in the sense that he died. He died on the spot, on the spot from a sudden stroke. So very clear indication of how severe this is. Okay, so uh, we'll continue now with the next one, which is the eighth disadvantage. You will be deprived of spiritual guides in all future lives. All future lives here means life after life. You will not be able to have a spiritual guide. You will not have a teacher. This is the opposite of one of the above advantages of relying on a spiritual guide. So the first of the advantage was that if you properly rely, then you become closer with the teacher. And then obviously, as you become closer with the teacher, you have a good relationship, then you progress along the grounds and paths, and so on and so forth. But here, it's the exact opposite. Not only will you not meet with a guru, but you will be born only in places where there is no chance of hearing even the word Dharma. So you will not meet with the guru, you will be born in a place where there are no teachings, not even the word Dharma. So in other words, you will not meet with the Buddhist teachings. And if you do not meet with the Buddhist teachings, if you do not have an opportunity to listen to the teachings, to get some advice, it means that you will only engage negativity. And the result of that negativity that you create is that you will be born in the lower migrations. It's almost like a chain of events and you can see the reasoning, how one action brings the next and because of that the next and the next and the next. So 
you disparage the guru, you don't rely properly. It means in your next life you will not meet with any gurus, you will not have any teachings. You will, as a result of that, you will only engage in negativity. As a result of that, you will only be reborn in the lower migrations. So very serious. In short, as Jay Rinpoche says, thus any good fortune you may have, and so forth. This is actually a line from the lines of experience. So Jay Rinpoche has a particular verse there that says, any good fortune, anything good that happens to you in this and future lives is the result of properly relying with thought and action upon the spiritual guide. So we know that there are two ways that we must rely upon the teacher. One is the thought, so you have this respectful attitude, and the other one is through your actions, your activity. So if you properly rely in this way, then all the good things, all the opportunities, uh, all the progress along the path will come your way. And he says, therefore, always respect it. This is the way that I practice. You, the yogi who wishes li to obtain liberation, should also practice this way. So this is the verse from Lama Tsongkhapa. And then it says, that it is all your worldly good fortune resulted from reliance on a spiritual guide. So remember, there are two ways to rely, by thought and by action. Any misfortune, so misfortune here is things that are undesirable, things that you don't want to experience. So any misfortune is the result either of not relying on one or of letting your devotion lapse. If your devotion lapses, you will be deprived of virtuous spiritual guides, not only in this life, but in the future rebirths as well. So you uh, have devotion initially, you establish the relationship, then this declines, you start criticizing the guru, and the result is that you will not meet with spiritual guides uh, for life after life after that. Also, the essence of nectar, Lam Rim says, Though you may occasionally attain rebirth in the upper re realms, the results of your disrespect will be congruous with the cause. You will be born in places with no opportunity and will not hear the word of Holy Dharma, nor a word from a spiritual guide. So it says, as we said before, it says you will be born in a place with no opportunity. So you will be born in a place in a barbaric place, uh, in a remote location where there are no teachings of the Dharma there. So you will not have the opportunity to listen to the Dharma and then modify your behavior accordingly. You will be left without instructions, meaning you will engage negativity, meaning for, the, for, for you know, it says occasionally you might be reborn in the upper realms, which indicates, however, the majority, you will be in the lower realms. Um, not only do we not think over our guru devotion, but our ill-considered and thoughtless actions have subtle karmic connections. So what he's saying here is that we don't really pay proper attention to this very important relationship. And every aspect of um, our um, interaction with the guru is actually creating, has some consequences, right? So uh, there are some connections here. Very suspicious and inauspicious gestures can occur. So it's going to give some examples here. It was an inauspicious gesture that Milaropa, Milarepa offered Marpa an empty copper pot. Okay, so Milarepa went to see Marpa and when he first saw him, he was carrying an offering. And the offering that he had was a very large copper pot. However, he made the mistake to offer the pot empty. So usually when you offer a container or a pot or something like that, it is much better if you fill it up with different other objects, other offerings. So don't offer something empty. But Milarepa offered Marpa a copper pot, quite large, that was empty. And then what Marpa did, so that was slightly inauspicious, not very good. But what Marpa did was that he took the pot and he actually striked the pot. And because it was made out of copper, it made that noise 
very loud and very melodious noise. And that noise, the echo, resonated for quite a long distance. And that was considered to be a very auspicious sign or auspicious interdependence because actually it indicated that Milarepa would become a great teacher whose teaching was spread in a long distance for a long time and so on and so forth. So as you can see, um, you know, slight, you know, when we meet with the teacher, when we interact with the teacher, um, every aspect of our behavior creates something which might be auspicious or inauspicious. Okay, so we're looking at this auspicious and inauspicious interdependence that is created by those seemingly innocent activities, isn't it? Interactions. So again about the empty copper pot. Now, um, the fact that Milarepa offered this empty pot, empty here, you know, also makes us think about emptiness. And as we say, this pot uh, could resonate, create, you know, very a very strong sound and that was very good and that was an indication that actually the practice that Milarepa was would be able to do would be great practice and indeed you know he reached the state of enlightenment in one lifetime so that was an indication of he would practice he would have realizations of emptiness and so on and so forth um, now um, the fact that the pot was empty was slightly inauspicious and actually it created a situation where Milarepa for the rest of his life, he never had enough food. He was never getting enough food, enough nourishment. So he was always starving. So they say, you know, that was actually indicated or established from that activity, that action of offering a pot that it was empty. Okay, then it continues by saying, when Marpa first offered him some beer, Milarepa drank a lot, and this was an auspicious gesture. So when did that happen? Milarepa went uh, to look for his teacher Marpa, and when he arrived in the village or in the location, Marpa was actually plowing his field. And he approached him, Milarepa approached him, he says, look, I'm looking for the house of uh, Marpa. Do you know? Do you know who is Marpa? Do you know where he lives? And Marpa himself said, oh, yeah, you know, you see this house up there? That's the house. That's the house of your teacher. But before you go there, uh, I would like you to do a couple of things for me. First of all, I want you to finish plowing the field, the entire field. And once you finish the job, I want you to drink this pot of beer. Okay. And then he left, Marpa left and went up in the house. Now, Milarepa was so extremely delighted that he had finally found directions. And now he knew where the house of his Lama was, that he had no problem plowing the entire field. And after he finished plowing the field, he drank all the beer. And then he went up in the house, right? So they say that because he did exactly what his Lama told him to do, he did these activities, he finished them as they should be done, the auspicious interdependence that came from that was that he completed the entire path and he reached a state of enlightenment in that one lifetime. So. You know, you can see auspicious and inauspicious interdependence established from this way. Anyway, there are many stories about Milarepa and Marpa. Geshe says, I think you know quite a few of them. And actually, it's not a good idea to go to all the stories because uh, Liberation in the Palm of the Hand is a long text and we're making it longer <laughs> with all the stories. So we won't have any more Milarepa stories for the time being. <laughs> So then we have another story. It says, when Marpa prostrated himself to a tutelary deity instead to his guru Naropa, it was an inauspicious gesture. Okay, so what is the story? Uh, Marpa was uh, relying upon Naropa and uh, he was actually sleeping. They were sleeping in the same room, in the same quarters. And uh, one morning, Naropa manifested the entire mandala of his yidam. 
So there was the, all the deities and the whole mandala up in the sky. And then he woke up Marpa and he said, my child, wake up, wake up. Your Yidam and the whole mandala have arrived here in the room, in the sky, right above you. Wake up and see the mandala. So Marpa wakes up and sees the mandala. And then Naropa says, to whom are you going to prostrate? Are you going to prostrate to your Yidam or are you going to prostrate to me? And Marpa thought, look, you know, the guru, I see him every day, but the Yidam and the mandala, I, I only see them today. So he prostrated to the mandala. And then Naropa indicated to him that he made a mistake. He says, you made a mistake. And he, he gave him a verse where he said, even the thousand Buddhas of this aeon, they come in dependence upon the Guru. Nothing is there without the Guru. So he says, what do you think? You know, or how does anyone become enlightened? How does anyone become a Guru? You become a guru by relying on the teacher. The teacher is going is the one who will give you the instructions to reach the Buddhahood that you're looking for. So between the Yidam and the Guru, the Guru is the one that is the most important, the most precious. All the Yidams, all the Buddhas, they come from the Guru. So the Guru in that sense is the more important. So as you can see, even those great beings made some mistakes at some point and every one of uh, the actions that we do when we interact with the guru can create either positive or negative in auspicious or inauspicious interdependence so um we uh, the result or the consequence of uh, uh marpa prostrating to the deity rather to the to his own to his own teacher Naropa was that ultimately his lineage was very short and Naropa explained this to him that because you made the wrong choice in terms of prostrations uh, although you will be a great teacher you will not have a long lineage and this is how it came to happen and then it says Kyapche Papomkar Rinpoche spoke in detail of how Drumtumpa relied on Setsuen and Atisha and how Atisha relied on Sudvaran Vipa, Milarepa on Marpa, and how Jesu Kappa applied gold leaf to the walls of the room where Kungpo Lepa gave him the initiations, and so on. So some examples of stories of proper reliance with auspicious interdependence. So devotion to a spiritual guide is vital. Even the smallest auspicious or inauspicious gestures have their consequences. Kyapche Babonka then told the story about Gelsa Rinpoche and how he had intended to debate with Jay Rinpoche before the two had ever met and what happened when he came into Jay Rinpoche's presence. Um, okay, so there was Gelsa Rinpoche, you know, Gelsa Rinpoche and Kedru Rinpoche where became the two main disciples of uh, Lama Tsongkhapa. However, when they, uh, before they met him, they were great teachers and great debaters. They were quite famous themselves. And when they initially went there to see him, to meet Lama Tsongkhapa, Lama Tsongkhapa was sort of like the rising star, right? Uh, Gyatsa Rinpoche went there with the intention of debating him and defeating him. Although his intention was not very good we have to understand and you know it was mixed with pride and so forth we have to understand that at that time he was not his disciple right he was just going to meet him for the first time but uh, although he went with this intention when he understood uh, the great qualities of Lama Tsongkhapa you know all of this disappeared and he properly devoted himself to him so it says here, although Gyatsa Rinpoche's motives were unfortunate, but it turned out to be auspicious. Many things can happen. Good motives may turn out to be inauspicious. One must be careful. Now, there is a story about Gyatsa Rinpoche and Kedru Rinpoche. And Gyatsa says, I don't know if that is uh, how things happen, and I don't know how if that is exactly correct. But this is the story. When they were going to meet to see Lama Tsongkhapa for the first time, 
gets up Brahmache, said to Kedra Brahmache, look, you know, we are great um, teachers, great debaters ourselves. When we go and see him, we are not going to prostrate in front of him. Right? Right. So Getsa Brahmache said, I am not going to, to prostrate. And he more or less instructed Ketru Brahmache not to prostrate. So they were going there and they had their mind very clear that they were going, not going to prostrate. However, they, pro they were, when they were walking there, they were wearing the Pandita hats, which are kind of like quite, you know, tall hats. Okay. So as they were approaching Jerem the protector of Gandan uh, is a protector who actually has, is holding an implement that has a hook. And it is said that the hook of the protector um, caught the hat of Gelsa Brimbache and actually threw it down to the ground. Once his hat was down in the ground, Gelsa Brimbache just bent over to pick up his hat. And as he bent over, basically, you know, he lowered himself and he prostrated. And Kedro Brimbache, who was coming behind, said, oh, he told me he was not going to prostrate, but now he's prostrating. So he says, if he's prostrating, I'm prostrating as well. So both of them prostrated, although they had, they had said that they wouldn't. Anyway, Gesha says, I don't know if it happened exactly like this, but that's the story. So uh, we're going for the last paragraph here. It says, when we use our guru's name, we say Kushu, which is roughly translated as Mr. So Kushu so and so and kushu such and such. Don't do this. You must use some form of honorific with his name, such as his reverence. So always use honorific in front of the name of the Lama, always use some respectful language. Um, so for example, we say his reverence or his eminence. Uh, when we say, for example, Lama Losang Tupuan Doji Chang, use the full name as, you, um, as much as you can. It says, whenever Atisha used uh, Sadhvar and Vipa's guru's name, he would clasp his hands together and call him the great Shurnanavipa. He would immediately stand up if anyone else uttered, uttered Sudvarnadvipa's name. So if someone mentioned his guru's name without honorific, without respect, without praise, um, and so forth, or without using a proper title, he would immediately stand up to indicate he was displeased by this behavior. And then Papom Karimbache continues by saying, I'm not trying to put myself forward. To put myself forward means, you know, I'm not trying to say that I am perfect or important or I do everything right, but I am unhappy whenever I see my own precious guru's name used casually. So I'm not happy when other people use my guru's name without proper honorifics and without proper respect. Now, if your guru is still alive, you should not use the honorific phrase whose name I speak with difficulty. This particular phrase is only used if the guru uh, has passed away, is deceased. If the guru is alive, we don't use this particular phrase. Okay, so this concludes this uh, section. And it says, Pabon Karimboche then reviewed the above headings twice once in some detail and once quite briefly. So we have gone over time and we have completed this uh, section. So you know when we do the confession to the 35 Buddhas, so we begin by saying to the Bhagavan, the Arhat, the fully enlightened being, Guru Shakyamuni, I prostrate, and then we continue with the names of all the other Tathagatas, and we say, I prostrate, I prostrate, I prostrate, so it's the names. Uh, we have the first sentence, which is the full epithet and honorifics of Buddha Shakyamuni, and then we have all the names of the 35 Buddhas, and after every name we say, I prostrate to this, I prostrate to this, I prostrate to this. Um, so with this, we are actually praising and honoring Buddha Shakyamuni for all his great qualities. Okay, 
So um, very important to maintain these honorifics when we are addressing the guru, when we're using the guru's name. Thank you very much.